Hello, and welcome to today's movie review. And in honor of Indiana Jones being released on Netflix this month, today we're going to talk about all four films. We are also going to get into a little bit of what I hope to see out of the rumored Indiana Jones 5. First, we're going to talk about Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Now, this film was first released in 1981. And it, it shows. Uh, it's a product of its time. And, well, the first three films are all product of its time, but we'll get there when, when we talk about the other ones. Um, the fonts that are used for like the opening credits and things like that are hilariously dated. Though that kind of thing doesn't take away from the film, it's just, it just is what it is, I guess. Um, the story's set in 1936, and it has Indiana Jones doing what he does best, hunting for artifacts and things of that sort. Uh, it also has uh, it also has Karen Allen in it uh, as Marion Ravenwood. And it also has John Reese davies as Sala. Now, one of the things I didn't realize about this film was that one of the most iconic scenes uh, out of Indiana Jones, you know, where he's like got that bag of sand and he's trying to steal the idol and swap it and then it ends with this rolling boulder coming at him. That happens in the first 10 minutes of this film. And I went, wow, I haven't seen these films in that long that I forgot this happened this early in the franchise. And that kind of just mesmerized me. It just kind of drew me in and I was off to the races. Um, and it, it kind of takes the uh, damsel in distress trope and flips it on its head. Now, while Marion uh, Ravenwood, Ma well, now while Marion Ravenwood would now, while Marion Ravenwood can be considered a uh, damsel in distress, she's not. She's just really not his equal and in terms of what she's doing in the story. That's just a product of when it was released. But the one thing they do about turning that trope on its head is they make her a hard-drinking bar owner who has this piece that Indy needs. Now, I'm not going to go full into the plot of the film, but there's this argument that without Indiana Jones, the Nazis would never have found the Ark. Spoilers. I mean, they find the Ark. I mean, that's kind of what happens in these films. They find what they're looking for. But without Indiana Jones doing what he does, the Nazis probably never would have found it. Well, I guess that's not true because the way they were working, they would have eventually found it. It would have just taken years to find it. Now, while I enjoyed this film overall and think it's one of the best two, one of the top two of four uh, films in the franchise, it made me ask questions like, how is this possible? How is that possible? Wouldn't this species have died with the conditions? All that kind of stuff. But it was, it had this level of relatability where I could for the most part, suspend disbelief in that point. Next, we're going to talk about Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Now, this was released in 1984 and is set in 1935, one year before Raiders of the Lost Ark. Now, instead of bringing back Karen Allen as Marion Ravenwood, we're introduced to a singer named Willie Scott, who's played by Kate Capshaw. She's kind of that typical damsel in distress. She's always screaming, always going on about not being able to do something, pretty used to essentially over sexualize the film she ends up in this white dress that gets torn all up showing midriff and and other parts that, that they use to over sexualize her character making it muddy and wet and even though it's made in the 80s i was surprised that dress didn't turn see-through with how far that they were going though that would have pushed it into an R rating instead of the PG rating that it got. Because at this time, PG-13 didn't exist. The plot of this film revolves around Indiana Jones and his group, which consists of Willie Scott and Short Round, played by Jonathan K. Kwan, on finding mystical Indian stones. Turns into a rather lackluster uh, chase film. I, it's got a pretty cool minecart chase, which 
I've always been a fan of the the whole minecart thing all the way going back to the first time that I played Donkey Kong Country on the Super mm. Nintendo and to see a minecart scene that predates my experience with a minecart chase was was fun and enjoyable. There is one scene that I really didn't enjoy though, and this goes back to the over the over sexualization of Willie Scott. And that's this scene in an Indian palace where Indiana and Willie, they go back and forth and it makes you go, who is more attracted to the other? Are they going to sleep together? This, that, and the other thing. And it, it just went on too long and I felt that it could be cut and the film would be better for it. It did end up leading to one humorous scene uh where willie is pushing up on statues to try to open a secret passageway like indiana had done overall this film isn't the best of the series but it isn't the worst of the series either so it's okay um i found it not pulling my attention because i couldn't get behind uh not necessarily the mytholo uh, mythology point of it but the whole well, I'm, I'm not going to get into the spoiler on, on, on what uh, kind of pulled me out of it. Just go ahead. Um, I recommend you watch it. And when it happens, when those things happen, I'm certain you will see what I'm talking about. The next film we're going to talk about is Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Uh, this film released originally in 1989. Uh, has an interlude that is set in 1912. And then the main story takes place in 1938. This setting allows for Indiana Jones to go against the Nazis once again. And it seems to me that Indiana Jones works best while in a race against time to stop the Nazis from finding something of either historical or religious importance. Uh, this time, instead of going after the Lost Ark, he is going after the Holy Grail. Joining him is his father, Dr. Henry Jones, played by the great Sean Connery, and Marcus Brody, who is played by Denholm Elliott. Uh, we once again see uh, Sala from Raiders of the Lost Ark. And this film has a femme fatale as a female lead instead of a damsel in distress. This is Dr. Eliza Schneider, played by Allison Duty. This character actually brought in a aspect to Indiana Jones that I was happy to see. We know throughout the series so far to this point that Indiana Jones enjoys being in the company of women, particularly smart women. And to see his interactions with Dr. Snyder here emphasizes that and proves to be a good foil for him. This film not only pits him against Nazis, it takes him to the Nazi capital of Berlin. And so close to Hitler that Hitler signs a journal for him without realizing what's going on. And anyone who knows the Indiana Jones series knows that that is an iconic scene followed by their escape from Berlin. It is just so much fun to, to watch Indiana Jones being so close to being ca caught and yet finding a way out of it without making a plan. I enjoyed The Last Crusade probably the most out of all four of the Indiana Jones films. So if you only have time to watch one of these films, this is the one that I would recommend that you watch the most. The final film we're going to talk about today is Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. This film was released in 2008, almost 20 years after The Last Crusade. So they pushed the story up forward almost 20 years as well, setting it in 1957. And instead of pitting Indiana Jones against Nazis, they pit him against the Soviet Union's KGB. When I first watched this film upon its release, uh, almost 11 years ago now, it didn't bother me. Uh, I don't know if that's just because I was younger and easily entertained. Don't get me wrong, I was entertained by this film. But this watch through, I've, I can see a lot clearer why so many critics didn't like this film. While the previous trilogy had 
aspects that you had to shut your mind off to. This one had so many that it wasn't even funny. Like, everybody quotes the refrigerator scene. And throughout the film, that is not the only instance where the movie asks you to suspend your disbelief. This time, I'm actually going to talk about the villain. It is a woman this time, so it, it does kind of another femme fatale kind of thing. But this time, it's played by the great Kate Blanchett. And she, while the accent is understandable, it's kind of corny. It just, for me, it was. But I enjoyed her performance outside the accent. We also bring back Marion Ravenwood. And you can see the chemistry between her and Indiana Jones. Chemistry has grown. Now, while you saw love in the Raiders of the Lost Ark, you see a lot more here and a lot less fighting, even though it is there. Uh, it also introduces Mutt Williams, played by Shia LaBeouf who in the years following this, the release of this film was rumored to be taking over the franchise. Okay, I guess I can understand why you would want to do that, but Indiana Jones always seems to work best while going against Nazis. This film shows that there is potential with Indiana Jones chasing the Soviet Union into other artifacts of antiquity. This story, though, in particular, deals with South American crystal skulls. And the route they decided to go with it was another large area where you had to suspend disbelief. Though there is precedent within the series about needing where they go with it to an extent. It was just very hard to see in this world that, the, that was created in the 80s why and where and how they ended up where they did in Kingdom of Crystal Skull. And I thought that John Hurt while his performance as Dr. Osley was interesting, it was way too over the top, and I don't fault John Hurt for that. That is completely the writer's fault with the, where they sent this story. Speaking of new characters like John Hurt, there is Ray Winstone's Mac, who they tried to give you backstory between him and Indiana Jones through dialogue. Everything that happens with him I am not invested in that character to the point to where the emotional responses that they try to pull out, I just didn't have. Overall, this film is probably the weakest of the four. Uh, there is a, a jock greaser fight that wasn't necessary, but I understand why they thought they needed it. And the introduction to Indiana Jones is actually not that bad especially for him being away almost 20 years. The series as a whole has tropes within it, which you, you can see. There's always the Paramount Pictures logo melting into some form of mountain or hill, uh, Indiana Jones and his treatment of women. And it seems like every film starts with Indiana Jones going after some artifact and then transitioning into the main artifact of the story. Kingdom of the Crystal Skull went more away from those tropes, but spent more time trying to pay homage and honor previous films, like showing the location of certain artifacts after um, we haven't seen them for so long. Overall, I enjoyed half of the films, and the other half I thought could have been better, but I am interested in seeing Indiana Jones 5. And it is my hope that they kind of go back to that Indiana versus Nazi thinking. But this, of course, would bring Harrison Ford as kind of, as much as I hate to say it, too old for the role and needing to be transitioned into another actor. Um, I always liked the dynamic of Indiana Jones in his classroom as well. You can see things like female students hemming and hawing and being in absolute love with him and if you tell the story as Indiana Jones as Harrison Ford in a classroom say in the 60s and talking about a story that happened in the 30s or even one of his exploits in World War II in the 40s which we never touch and we only talk about in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull this would allow for a new actor and a more action-driven story that seems to be more prevalent in today's cinematic experience. 
I have hopes for Indiana Jones 5, and I, I'll watch it when it comes out, just from the love that I have from this series overall. Well, like I said, it is on Netflix now. Um, so if you haven't seen uh, seen these films, I do recommend that you do. And then uh, go ahead and pop a comment below and let me know what you think about the series as a whole or maybe even just one or two of the films that you've seen. And uh, let's get that conversation going. So without any further ado, I hope you all have a great night.